I think, Jerry, with most of the segments that we've seen with bereaved parents because of suicide of a child, they said, we didn't know, we didn't know. That is not true in the case of Deborah Myers, who's coming up. No, and I'd like to set it up for our viewers because I think this is maybe the warning of all warnings that if you have a son or daughter who is exhibiting suicidal ideation or warning signs, the whole key is they have to be taken to somebody qualified, somebody that has expertise. Now, in this case, Deb Myers took her son, who was a diabetic, depressed, to a counselor, not once but twice, a mental health facility. And the screening therapist was not discerning, turned the boy away two times, and he was so desperate to get someone's attention that he went home and burned his house down. Then he ended up in juvie, and when he was in the juvenile institution, that same mental health therapist came by. The mother said, do you remember? We were with you and you did not do what he needed done. The young man later went home and on a Friday night hung himself in the basement downstairs. So this is a very, very important clip for our parents to watch and to learn from. The young boy who died is Zachary. He was 16. Yes. Here's Jerry with his mom. Zach's story is different because he made uh, repeated warning, he had violent behavior, and he was assessed more than once, and they turned him away. Why? They believed he had depression. They believed that. But um, also, he was a type 1 diabetic, so he was dependent on insulin. They felt that had a lot to do with his moods, his swings, which sugar does. Sugar, you you know, if your sugar is low, it nothing something doesn't connect upstairs, and you do you do irrational things. You get delirious. It's almost like you're drunk, and you know he has had low sugar. But when he has low sugar, he's like, "Hi, mom, I love you," and he'll put his arm around, and I literally have to help him walk to sit down to, so he can get insulin. <laughs> That's how he would be with if he got behind on his insulin. But it can put you in swings. Sugar, diabetes is huge. And I think they kind of wanted to use that as a cause, not the mental illness. The few hours before Zach's death, what was going on? Zach's like, I'm just going to go and read. We have to have a book read by Monday. He goes, his teacher just gave it to him, and I want to read. I'm just going to lay in bed and read. And he, I'm like, OK. So I kept going in and checking on him. Sometimes he'd come out and he'd talk to us. Then Katie went in. I said, did you, did you check on Zach at all? Did you see Zach when you? She goes, no, I didn't. I forgot. I said, oh, I will. I'm like, Zach, Zach. I'm like, Maybe you went for a walk. And then I went back downstairs. And um, uh, there he was. And I ran over to him by the shower. And I just picked, I just grabbed him, I screamed. I just screamed as soon as I saw him. I grabbed him, I picked him up. And I screamed, Katie! And she came running in and she caught it. And, um, like called 911 or something. I don't know, it was just like a disaster. And I'm like, he's breathing, I can hear him. You know, you could hear him gasping, you know. It had to just be, like, right then. I mean, it had to just be soon. I know it was soon, so I thought, oh, he's gonna come back, he's gonna come back, because I could hear him. So we were trying to give him CPR, and I'm trying to give directions, and then Katie's like, just go out, and so they can find you. And so I'm standing in the road, and I'm just screaming, hurry up, hurry up. I don't know. So, I uh, it was just like, I kept thinking they were going to bring him back because I know I heard him breathe. And then they told me that they weren't going to. And that was the worst thing ever. And he's laying on the basement floor, and I just didn't ever want to let him go. 
Did you think about committing suicide after Zach's death? <laughs> I think about it all the time. All the time. I'm not even this person. <laughs> Normally, I'm, I used to be happy. And now I just feel like I don't have purpose. He was all I had, you know, so. And I know, I, I feel like I just want to be with him. So, yeah, I do struggle all the time, but <laughs> I know, I, th I think I don't think I would do it. I just think about it. I wish I going to all these different funerals, and I'm like, why can't it be me? <laughs> why can't I go to heaven? <laughs> oh, she already has a place prepared on that tombstone. Well, we went to the cemetery at her request before we left the city. And when I stood there and I looked at the picture that they had in the, in the tombstone, I just thought to myself, here was a desperate young man. And it's the flip side, Moira. I mean, he wanted help. The mental health therapist fumbled the ball after two screenings, burned his house down. I mean, could there be any more of a warning sign to say, look, I'm hurting. And of course, a broken marriage. A father had been married four times. The oh. weekend he died, uh, Zach was supposed to spend time with his dad. And his dad texted his ex-wife and said, I can't come for Zach this weekend. She, she said he saw that on her cell phone. It wasn't but a few hours later that he hung himself downstairs. You know, this book looks at the biology of suicide, and it's something that's an ongoing study. I have learned more in this two weeks than I ever imagined on the subject. But we see some of the ingredients. It is relational. It can be chemical. Uh, for this young man, it was a combination. And it's always spiritual, right? Absolutely. There's an enemy at work 24-7 to said, take us out. You know what? The, to, to balance the book, I told the story of a pastor of mine who killed himself after a very successful career, but a man who was living in incognito adultery, and uh, his sin finally caught up with him. But on the flip side, we talk about many of the other, and I, that's an interesting term you just used, the biology of suicide. And you know, really, we live in an age today where there's so, we could garner the expertise of so many people. So we've loaded the book up with a lot of resources. And it's really a handbook for pastors and youth pastors and adults. And I, no one can say after reading that book, they don't have the basic mechanics to navigate around anyone. And let's remember, the people that are committing the suicide the most, completing suicide, our senior adults. Yeah. So this isn't an adolescent only deal. Could you have imagined when you began this project, writing this book, that it would be a national conversation today? You know, we had no idea because this was something that as we prayed here at Crossroads a number of weeks ago, over a Swiss chalet at lunch, we began thinking about youth. And uh, the, the commission was given to me to go write a book. And so I wrote the book in Halifax, and I would look at that McDonald Bridge that I went over several times, knowing that one of the city's most prominent families had experienced a tragedy of their grandson jumping off that bridge. Mm -hmm. And I just said to myself, you know, it is so much, now, now it's time. You know, God is using these deep social problems as really an opportunity for evangelism. Because when we present the gospel, just like in my case, my suicidal ideation, I was living on Valium and sleeping pills every day. It stopped when I received Jesus Christ. So, and like Ron said earlier, we will never ever minimize the power of God to literally change everything in an instant. I just took this card out of its envelope and I want you to get the message because it's for you too. This is 100% biblical. This is God's heart. You are chosen, called, honored, treasured, gifted, precious, loved. That's just a fact. Whoever you are, wherever you are today, inside 
And thanks, Connie, for this. Isaiah 43, verse 4. This is one of my favorite scriptures. The Lord says, you are precious and honored in my sight. I love you. I don't know what other messages you're getting today, but you can just tune them out because this is what the king of the universe says about you. And you know, I, we've been talking about, I, forgive me, but I'm just going to fess up. Many of us have said, I'm glad this is the last day. Emotionally, this has been a dark place to go. But one of the myths, but an important place, let me add. One of the myths you say in the book, Jerry, is that talking about suicide will have, you know, carry the power of suggestion. That is not the case. No, it, it is the biggest myth. I mean, I've been in so many high schools where kids have completed suicide before I stood on the platform to speak. Anyone who says that, and I say it very, very respectfully and sincerely, they explain their ignorance to this topic. Every suicidologist globally will tell you the reason this problem continues, like many other problems, is we're not talking enough about it. Pedophilia is the same way. We, I could just go right down the laundry list of acute problems. Pornography. Where, yeah, where the, the average person is illiterate, and so the problem continues to gestate and grow. Crossroads Publishing, through Why They Die, is doing the exact opposite, giving truth. Jerry, thanks. Thanks for uh, your honesty. I, I loved your story. I thought I lived in a wild household growing <laughs> up, but uh, yeah. Um, it doesn't matter how crazy, how wild. There is hope, and uh, you'll be encouraged. Maybe it's just a wayward young person or child that, uh, that's on your heart today. There's so much hope in here and so much help as we go forward. Make sure you get your copy.